And so I hope that, that the last two lectures have given you some idea of, of uh, what fitness is and how it affects, in particular, how it affects the, the, the dynamics of populations. But of course, we haven't really said much about what it is in a, in a, in a more biological sense. So, so far, what we have done in order to assign fitness, so, so far, we have assigned fitness to types. Okay, so fitness is some number. And I haven't really told you what these types are, right? So I, I call them A and B, and, uh, uh, and you know, you, you're supposed to imagine that they are red or green bacteria and so on, but I haven't really told you what they are. Now, what are the types, what, what the, of course, um, uh, biologically what the types are is that they are the heritable properties of an organism, and, and uh, this is ultimately encoded in the DNA, okay? So in fact, um, the, the, so in fact, the heritable um, features of an organism are encoded in its DNA. And so uh, this is what we will in the following call the genotype, right? So the, geno the DNA uh, uh, defines the genotype of the organism. <clears throat> and uh, so fitness depends in some sense on the genotype. Of course, it depends on a lot of other things as well. It will depend on your environment. It will depend on the interaction with other organisms and so on. So in principle, the mapping from genotype to fitness is something very complicated, and it's, uh, in some sense, it entails most of biology. So if you think about developmental biology, how the organism develops from the embryo to the adult, if you think of ecology, how organisms interact with each other, all that, in the end, somehow factorizes into fitness. Now here, and this is sort of, again, in some sense, similar to what, what Satya told you on Monday about the use of random matrices. So if, you know, if, if a physicist encounters unmanageable complexity, he tends to ignore it and replace it by something random. So that's more or less a strategy that we will pursue here, but we're not the only one to do that. So this idea that you can basically bypass this complicated route from, from genotype to fitness is something that biologists have, have uh, done already a long time ago, so I'll show some historical slides later. This concept essentially derives also from the 1930s from Sewell Wright. So the assumption that we will be making here, which is of course a, a huge simplification, um, is that we can indeed simply regard fitness as a function of the genotype, okay? And, and this is true, this will be true approximately at least if we're considering uh, evolution in a static and, and uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, given a fixed environment. Um, so the assumption here is that, um, um, so at least in a static environment, Fitness can be assigned directly to the genotype. And this is what the fitness landscape is. So the fitness landscape is exactly the mapping from genotype to fitness, okay? And, and the, 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 the reason why this is important is, is because the space of genotypes has a certain structure. It's a space of sequences, and so there comes a, a, a certain amount of 
mathematical structure with that um, that will turn out to be important and interesting. So that's sort of what I want to uh, uh, try to try to develop here. And so, so the first thing that we need to understand, so this is now a kind of genuinely biological term, um, which I could avoid using, but I prefer to actually use it because also if you go, go to the literature, I think you will encounter it all over the place. So this is the term epistasis. So this is, even within biology, it's, it's a term that is considered to be obscure and, and uh, it has many different meanings. Um, so my definition of this here is that, or the definition that I want to use, so epistasis um, expresses the fact that um, the, so, so the effects of different mutations on fitness, so what, we're, what we'll be interested in, of course, are changes in the genotype, right? So the changes in the genotype are mutations, and so we're interested in how fitness changes under these mutations, and, and um, epistasis means that um, these changes between different mutations are not independent, okay? So this is the interaction. Um, um, interaction between the effects of um, different mutations on fitness. And mutations, as I said, so a mutation is something that changes the genotype, right? So let me maybe try to, to um, you know, make a little cartoon of what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's suppose this is, this is my genome, right? So the genome is some sequence of uh, letters from the well-known well -known, uh, alphabet. So this is one genotype. And now uh, there can be mutations, right? And of course, there are many variants of mutations. There can be large-scale rearrangements in the genome and so on. We're not going to talk about that. But let's just imagine, just for, for a concrete loss, let's consider a simple mutation that changes, for example, this G into a C, okay? <clears throat> so then the genotype has changed, so this is a mutation one, okay? Um, and then there could be another mutation at another letter, so for example, this C could change into a G, all right? <clears throat> so this would be mutation two. And each of these mutations, in general, will come with some fitness effect, right? So we have, um, let's say we have um, uh, a kind of, uh, the, the initial genotype, so this is what we call the Y, this is again a, a piece of, of, of population genetics jargon, one calls this the wild type. So it's sort of the original type, the type that is present in the wild population, whatever, just a technical term. So this is my wild type genotype, and this has some fitness, let me call this W0. Okay. <clears throat> and now these mutants will have some fitness W1 or W2, right? Uh, so mutants. have fitness W1, W2. And now I'm asking what about the genotype that has both mutations, right? So now I can consider a double mutant, so these are single mutants, if you will. But now I can also consider the double mutant which has both of these mutations, right? Let me just try to copy this down. A C, so here we now have a C. E-A, A, another A, a T, 
And here we now have a G. And G and G. All right, so this would now be the double mutant. <clears throat> and this will have some fitness W12. Okay. Now I'm, I'm interested in interactions of fitness effects. So this means I'm interested in whether or not these two mutations act independently. Okay, now in order to, to detect whether this is the case or not, obviously I have to have some expectation of what the, the double mutant fitness should be if they didn't interact. Okay, so what is, the question is what is W, um, what should W12 be if the mutants did, mutations did not interact? So does anyone have a suggestion? <clears throat> product, very good. Why product? Oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, that's that's a very good idea. So that's essentially what I what I would like to do. So so um, uh, more precisely, uh, and and the, the I mean my argument why it should be a product is that at least the way we defined uh, um, fitness within the Wright Fisher and Moran model, it was always defined in sort of relative terms. So in some sense, only fitness ratios matter. Okay, so, so we know from these, from these models, um, from these models we know um, only fitness ratios matter. And so this means that what these, these two mutations actually are doing is that they are multiplying the original fitness by a factor. Um, so the single mutant effects <clears throat> So basically you go from W0 to W1, mutation 1, or you go to W2. But of course, if I'm, if I'm only interested in ratios, I can write this as the, the wild type fitness multiplied by W1 divided by W2. And similarly here, I can write this as a wild type fitness multiplied by W2 um, times uh, divided by W0. So, so the, the, um, the, what the mutants are doing is that they are multiplying the wild type fitness by some number. And uh, so um, uh, if, if they are independent, then I should just get the product, okay? So if they are independent, we expect that W12 is equal to the product of these two factors times the wild type fitness. And one of these W's zeros can cancel, so this just gives me W1, W2 divided by W0. Okay, so this is sort of the, uh, in, in, in uh, this terminology, this would be the non-epistatic expectation. This is what I expect to see if these mutations were independent. Right? So this is a non-epistatic expectation. Now it's it's uh, sort of in the long run it's a bit um, it's a bit cumbersome to deal with these products so uh, so we will be converting this to to um, uh, to to sums and and this is actually again a kind of a 
broad conceptual and somewhat murky issue in population genetics, whether you should think about fitness in multiplicative terms, as we just did, or if you should think about it in additive terms. But of course, mathematically, it doesn't make any difference because you can just, by taking logarithms, you can just turn these, uh, these uh, multiplications into additions. So um, in the following, we will use um, what is called the additive scale. Use an, so an additive fitness um, by simply defining. So these will now be the, the, the fitness values that I will be using in the following. Um, yes? So one of these cancels, right? Yes, here. No? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, so, so the logic is what the mutation is doing is that it's multiplying the, w no, the, the, the wild type fitness by a factor, right? And here I'm multiplying the wild type fitness by two factors. Right? I first, I mean, you know, think about it in a kind of sequential way. So first you do the first mutation, you multiply the, 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 the fitness. Uh, by this factor, and then you do the second mutation, and the factor will be the same as before. So, so therefore, you just multiply these two, right? You're not convinced. W1 times what W2, that's what you would like to do. Uh, no, because, because you see, this is, um, you have to take the initial fitness into account as well, right? So, so the, the mutational effect is, is, is described by, this, by the factor by which the initial fitness increases or decreases, right? Suppose you have some mutation that, because as I said in, the, in these models, only ratios matter. So the absolute value actually doesn't have any meaning, right? Um, so, so everything, you see all these definitions, have to, be, um, have to be invariant under multiplying all the fitness values by some factor, right? And if I say W12 is equal to W1 times W2, that wouldn't be the case. So, so it wouldn't have that invariance, right? So, so because absolute fitness values don't matter. And so, you know, basically you do one mutation that, that uh, gives you uh, twice as many children, and then there's a second mutation that would give you half as many children. And when you combine the two, you have the same fitness as before. Okay, so I think the key point here is really the independence of overall scale. So you don't want uh, the absolute fitness to matter. <clears throat> okay, you're, you're happy? Good, okay. Um, right, so now we just uh, um, uh, introduce these logarithms as, as uh, our fitness measure, and then of course everything becomes uh, additive, and so then we can write down the the non-epistatic expectation to be, and I'll let me call this F120, so the zero stands for uh, uh, non-epistatic, oh, let me write it down here, which is simply F1 plus F2 <coughs> minus F0. Okay, so that's sort of uh, what I should expect in the absence of um, any epistasis. And also, if there is epistasis, then I can quantify it by the deviation from this. And this is now, now the, the, the pairwise epistatic interaction. Um, <clears throat> so pairwise epistasis, because we just have a pair of mutations Later, I'll generalize this to, to more. So pairwise epistasis. Let me call this epsilon one, two. So this is the epistatic interaction between these two mutations. And so this is the actual fitness of the double mutant minus the fitness that I expect. 
which I can then write as F12 plus F0 minus F1 minus F2. <coughs> okay, so this is now a measure, and this is something that I can, in principle, and I'll show you some experimental data later, this is something that, in principle, I could now measure in an experiment by, by comparing the, the single mutants with a double mutant, okay? <coughs> Now, um, of course, in general, uh, there can be many mutations in the genome, and, and they can interact in, in uh, uh, complicated ways. So we want to develop a formalism that allows us to, to treat, to extend this picture to a general number of mutations. Um, <clears throat> so we want to generalize to L mutations. And for this, it's, it's useful to introduce a, a, a little bit of, of notation. So what I will do here is I will introduce a binary variable. A binary variable for each mutation, which I will call tau i. Um, <clears throat> And this is a kind of indicator variable which tells me whether the, this particular mutation is present in the genome or not. So this is equal to 1 if the ith mutation is present. And it's equal to 0 if the ith mutation is absent. And so now, if I, if I um, uh, uh, know all the, the, the fitness effects, then I can express the fitness as a function of these binary variables. And so let's do that for the case of two mutations um, that I just described. But these are not really probabilities, I don't think. I mean, you know, your intuition that, that multiplying things is, is, is uh, something that you do with probabilities is correct, but these are not really probabilities. So you shouldn't think about them as probabilities. Uh, some statistical weight. Sorry. Yeah. So this uh, on, the, on, on the not, then you multiply this by, uh, by some fraction of, uh, of mutation one, and then by, by fraction of mutation two, right? Uh, and so you calculate the fidelity of two mutations, but you could get the same sequence of mutations starting from different interfaces and having mutations in different places. Uh, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So, so this is so. All of this will be now uh, will be defined with reference to a particular initial sequence. Yeah. I, again, I don't think that it's you, you know you shouldn't you shouldn't really think of these as as probabilities. It's just some function. I mean, it's a function on the space of these sequences, and and what we're sort of. You know, what we sort of want to do is to distinguish the additive part of that function from the non-additive one. But, but, but it's true that everything will be defined with respect to this wild type, right? So this wild type is, is sort of the reference. I'm, I'm just asking whether there are mutations relative to that wild type or not. Okay, so if I have another wild type, the, the representation of this function would look different. Well, I mean, again, it's, it's not probabilities, right? So, and, and of course, the point is that generally it's not that, right? I mean, the point is that generally this will not be true. I mean, this is sort of what you would expect if there was independence, but in general there is not independence, right? So we're trying to measure the deviations of, from independence. No, why not? No, but you know, as I said, the, 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 this is the fitness effect, right? So the effect of the, 
the effect of the mutation is to increase the fitness by a certain factor, right? I mean, as I said, overall fitnesses don't matter. I can multiply, and you know, I can multiply all my fitness by a factor of 1,000 and nothing would change because what is relevant, it's like energy, right? I mean, absolute energy also has no meaning, right? So what, what matters are differences, and because it, what matters are differences, uh, the effect of mutation has to be described by multiplying what you already have by some factor. And independence means that these factors are multiplied together. It's a scale, if you will. Yeah. It's a scale. No, because then it's not invariant under multiplying. If you, you know, if I write, right, if I now multiply all my fitness values by a factor of 1,000, then these will be multiplied by a factor of 1,000, but this will be multiplied by a factor of, of 1 million. This is not what I want, right? It's not invariant under, under rescaling. Okay, let, let, let me maybe go a little bit further. I think, you know, this is... Yeah. F F one two is the log of of uh, W one two, right? No, it's not. No, it's not. This is the expectation. So let me put a zero here. This is what. This is what you would get if there were no, no interactions, right? This is the expectation. But the actual value, of course, is different, okay? Good. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's, uh, 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 let's try to uh, go on and, and uh, um, uh, use these, these uh, uh, binary variables. So with these binary variables, we can now represent for the case of these two mutations. Or two mutations. Um, represent the fitness of all four combinations because we have, you know, we have two possible mutations. So we have zero, the wild type, the first mutant, the second mutant, and the double mutant of all four combinations. as the following, so this is now, so f is now a function of tau 1 and tau 2, right? <clears throat> and what is it? Well, if there is no mutant, if there is no mutation, I get f0. Um, <clears throat> if um, if uh, I have mutation 1, then the fitness is changing, and I write a selection coefficient. So here I'm, I'm sort of introducing selection coefficients as well. I'll define them in a moment. Uh, if there is mutation 2 is present, I get another selection coefficient. And if both of them, them are present, I have to write my um, uh, epistatic interaction, where S1 and S2 are the selection coefficients of the single mutants. which are simply equal to, so S1 is equal to F1 minus F0, and S2 is equal to F2 minus F0. All right, so, so, so this, and this is, you know, if you will, um, an exercise to check that this will give you the right numbers, that is, f of 0, 0 is equal to f0. Well, I, I can actually do it here, so <laughs> it's not uh, f of 1, 0. So now I have one of these present, so this is f0 plus s1, which is equal to f1. f0, 1 is equal to f0 plus s2, which is equal to f2. And f of 0 of 1, 1 is equal to f0 
Okay, and now I have to put everything together. So then we have plus F1 minus F0 plus F2 minus F0 plus the epsilon 1, 2, which is on the far blackboard here. So this is F1, 2 plus F0 minus F1 minus F2. Okay, and now if you sort of look at what cancels, so this cancels with that, this cancels with that, and this cancels with that. And so now here we have F1, 2. Okay, so this way I have sort of, um, I, can, I can represent these four fitness values um, of these combinations in this form um, as a function of these binary variables where you now see there are sort of linear terms and this is sort of what I was saying before. So we have linear terms and we have a nonlinear term and, and if there is no epistasis then this nonlinear term is absent, right? So if there is no epistasis then the function is linear. <coughs> okay? Okay, and so this is now in a form where I can um, easily generalize it. So it's pretty clear, you know, if I now have, instead of having two mutations, if I have three mutations, I will have more combinations. And so basically I just have to write down a power, a, a series uh, containing terms um, of products of these taus to all orders. And this then gives me a representation of my fitness landscape. Okay, so now we can sort of generalize this to L mutations. So now I have L of these uh, indicator variables. So the fitness is now a function of these L binary variables. And there will again be a kind of wild type fitness, a constant term. Then there will be some linear terms, which I separate out. So this is the, the selection coefficient of the ith mutation. And then there will be the rest, and the rest, of course, now has to be a sum over all possible combinations of two or more mutations. So I write this as a sum over k from 2 to l, and then each term in the sum, it has a coefficient, which I call epsilon k. And this coefficient will, so this is a kth order epistatic interaction, and uh, so epsilon k will be, has to be defined with respect to some subset of my l indices. So I have to, sorry, I have to take and make another sum. This was too quick. So there's another sum here. So I have to sum over all the subsets of more, of two or more elements. So this is the sum, this is a sum over subsets I1 up to IK, which are subsets of the index set from zero to L. And each term has a coefficient epsilon k i1 up to ik, and it has a product tau i1 tau i2 up to tau ik. Okay. Okay, so these are all products of zeros and ones. Okay, so this is a... Um, and so, so there are a couple of observations that one can make. So if you, if you think about how many uh, subsets with k elements there are, right? So how many subsets with k elements of L indices are there? L choose k, right? And so, and, and here, so here we have, we have one term, we have L terms here, and here for each term, in the sum we have L, L choose K1, so if you sum all of that together, what you end up getting is 2 to the L, right? So altogether there are 2 to the L terms. And so we're describing this by 2 to the L um, 
coefficients. And so these coefficients are um, F0, the SI, so this is one. These are um, L and then the rest. And so here we'll have, you know, sum from k equal to 2 up to L, L choose k. So altogether this will be 2 to the L. And uh, there are 2 to the L coefficients, and this, of course, good because there are also 2 to the L fitness values. So this is a linear one-to-one -one transformation from the fitness values to these epistatic um, coefficients, right? So we have 2 to the L fitness values. So this is a representation of the fitness landscape through these coefficients, and the, 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 it is useful because it sort of separates out the linear or non-interacting or non-epistatic part from the non-linear or interacting or epistatic one, right? So this is sort of the non-epistatic part. And this is the epistatic part. Um, <clears throat> And of course, I mean, I think to many of you this will look familiar. So if you think about these binary variables, instead of being zeros and ones as being plus ones and minus ones as you would have in a spin model, then of course you all know that if you have terms that are linear in the spin variables, this corresponds to a magnetic field and acting on the spin which doesn't induce any interactions, right? And so here, but here, in, in, you know, rather than in an easing model, for example, you would have only pairwise interactions, but here in general we have interactions of all orders. Okay, it, it turns out that the, um, <clears throat> uh, it's not completely trivial to replace the zero one variables by the plus minus one variables. You can write this representation also in plus minus variables, uh, and it has some sl somewhat different mathematical properties. But I don't really want to go into that. If, if you're interested, we can talk about it later. At the moment, the point is just that this is sort of a general way of representing um, uh, uh, fitness landscapes and of sort of analyzing them with regard to interaction. So now you can ask questions about how, many, how much interaction is there? Are these interactions mostly pairwise or are there higher order interactions and so on? Okay, so this is a sort of a, a general way of representing uh, a fitness landscape. Okay. Okay, so now um, we're sort of describing everything in terms of these uh, zero, one variables. So now we need to think a little bit about what kind of space these sequences of zero, ones actually live on. <clears throat> and these are actually sequence spaces, right? So we're representing our genotype by the sequence of zeros and ones. And this is, uh, uh, these form a sequence space, so let's Think a little bit about sequence spaces. <clears throat> so this function f of tau, and so I'm going to, um, you know, for shorthand, just write this um, sequence as tau. So f of tau. Um, is a function on the space of binary sequences of length L. And so this we could write, for example, as the set zero one raised to the power L. 
And this, the, the, this space has a natural um, metric, which is a so-called Hamming distance. So, you know, it's obviously it's, it will be important to, to think about how far different genotypes are away from each other. And the natural metric here is related to mutations, right? So the more mutations you, you take, you make, because these mutations are processes that if you have an evolving population, they will take some time to occur. So this is sort of the natural unit of the step is one mutation. So we're going to introduce the Hamming distance, which is just uh, um, counts the number of mutations in which two sequences differ. So the Hamming distance between, this is, of course, as, as uh, some of you might know, this is a notion that, that is uh, uh, um, well known in computer science. Um, so the Hamming distance, uh, which I will call D, so this is now the distance between two sequences, uh, tau and tau prime. And this just consists in counting the number of elements where these two sequences differ, which you can write, for example, like 1 minus uh, Kronecker delta tau i and tau i prime. All right, so this is equal to the number, number of different elements in the two sequences. Okay, so now we have a set and we have a distance measure, and this defines um, the so-called uh, Hamming space, which in the case of binary sequences are uh, hypercubes. Um, the set 0, 1, L with the distance D defines a L-dimensional hypercube. So let me just draw some pictures to illustrate that. Okay, so let's look at the case L equal to 2. All right, so there we have... Um, four binary sequences, and they form a square. All right, so here is 0, 0, here is, let's say, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. All right, so this is a two-dimensional cube. L equal to 3 is slightly more interesting, and also the only case that is easy to draw, that is, you know, not completely trivial. So let's draw a cube. All right, so here we have all zeros. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, um, 0, 1, 1, uh, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And I guess there's one missing up here, which is 1, 0, 1. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional uh, hypercube, right? And you see there are no triangles, although I'm not sure that was your question. But this is sort of the, the structure that you get. And this, of course, you can now, you know, generalize um, to higher dimensions. I'll show you some pictures, some slides showing higher dimensional hypercubes later. And so this is an important, you know, these are very important pictures. You will see lots of them over the next days um, because this is in some sense the, if you will, the arena on which uh, these evolutionary processes occur, right? So basically, mutations correspond to steps in this, in this graph. So if I acquire a mutation at the first site, then I go here. If I acquire a second one, I go here will also allow for reversion. So I might lose one of these mutations again, and then I go here. So essentially, you know, mutation, uh, mutations induce pathways on these graphs. And selection means that these pathways will be sort of biased towards higher fitness, right? So let me maybe write this down because I think it's sort of a, an important general 
uh, a general point. So, um, so we have mutational pathways. Are sort of walks on this hypercube which are biased by selection to move towards increasing fitness. All right, so, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I can only use the properties that the space has, right? Um, or oh, so you're saying it's not a metric space. But I meant that uh, triangular inequality is not despised here. Okay. Between 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, the distance is 3. Uh -huh. Between 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. <coughs> so the sum uh, of distances between the left, between 0, 0, 0 and Okay, yeah, so I guess if, you know, if it doesn't satisfy the inequality, then, uh, then it doesn't, I mean, <laughs> I don't, so you know. Consider, for example, random walks on this, uh, in this space, using that to the fact that it's metric. Yeah, but, you know, there, distances. yeah, I think, but, you know, I don't think we have a choice, so we have to de live with a, with a space as it is, right? So maybe we can leave this for the for the tutorial. Um, Right, yeah, yeah. So there are no triangles. I mean, this is what I said. There are no triangles, but, but you know, the inequality, I think, is still okay. All right, okay. So this is uh, um, the, the structure. And, and so, so, you know, and so you, should, you should imagine all these vertices here to be carrying some fitness values, right? So it's basically, we're looking at a function on the space. And uh, we, can, we can generally describe the function by this expansion. Um, but in fact, we need, so, so it will turn out that in order to, um, uh, to describe the kind of dynamical processes on these uh, spaces that we're interested in, um, we need uh, one more concept, which is related to the concept of epistasis, but which is a little bit more specific, so that I have to introduce next. And this concept is called sine epistasis. So, so I should say the term epistasis uh, is very old. It was introduced more than 100 years ago in genetics. Um, but this concept of sine epistasis is actually quite recent. Um, and this goes back to a paper by Dan Weinreich and collaborators from 2005. And the idea is quite simple. So, so essentially, you know, I told you uh, that the, the general definition of epistasis is that 
um, the, the effect of a certain mutation is not independent from the effects of other mutations. So there's some interaction. Now, sign epistasis means that this interaction is such that the sign of the, the effect changes, right? So, so signs, of course, as we, as we uh, uh, discussed yesterday when we were talking about fixation probabilities, the fixation, so when a, when a new mutation occurs in the population, uh, its fixation probability depends crucially on, the, on whether it's, it's, it, it increases fitness or decreases fitness, right? So, so mutations that increase fitness will have a chance of fixing. Mutations that decrease fitness will not, okay? So, so essentially, the, the, the direction of evolution is always in the direction of increasing fitness. So it's important to know whether a certain mutation increases fitness or decreases fitness. And if this property is affected by other mutations, we talk about sign epistasis, okay? So this is my definition here. Um, <clears throat> A mutation is sign epistatic <clears throat> um, if the sign of its effect on fitness On fitness depends on um, <clears throat> other mutations. And now to, to visualize this, it's important to sort of, uh, you know, it, it's useful to to um, indicate the signs of different mutations in the graph, right? So to visualize this, we introduce what are called fitness graphs. Um, where um, arrows along the links <clears throat> of the hypercube um, point in, in the direction of increasing fitness. Okay, so let me, yeah, let me draw a new, new picture here. Okay, so let's look at the case, um, first the case, just L equal to 2, All right? So this is my graph. Okay, and now I, I want to draw, for each link, I draw an arrow which points in the direction of increasing fitness, right? So as I said, there's a function defined on the vertices of this graph, and I'm just recording whether this function increases or decreases. And so, for example, suppose that first both the mutation 1 and the mutation 2 increase fitness, then I draw the arrows like this, okay? Now, if there is no sign epistasis, this means that uh, the, the sign, so this means the sign of the mutation 1 in this, starting from this state is positive, and if there is no sign epistasis, then the sign of mutation of 1 always has to be positive. So this means that this arrow also has to go up, and this arrow also has to go to the right. Okay, so this would be a case without sign epistasis, and the way to recognize this is that all parallel arrows have the same direction. Okay, no sign epistasis. Um, 
all parallel or um, point in the same direction. Now let's do another example. So let's suppose that, again, when I start from the wild type, both mutations increase fitness. Um, but now, uh, the, the, if, I, if I add, um, if I now add the second mutation to the first, it actually decreases fitness. So now I would have an error going in this direction, whereas this error, for example, would still go here. Right? So this would be a case where the, the first mutation um, uh, displays, so the mutation uh, at this side here does not display sign epistasis because the arrows are only up, but the mutation at the second side displays sign epistasis. Okay? Okay, so the mutation at, at tau2 displays sign epistasis. And finally, I could have a situation where they both display sign epistasis. So that would be a case where these arrows point in this direction and these arrows both point down, right? And this is then called reciprocal sign epistasis. <clears throat> and so technically what this means is that you take you take your hypergroup and you make it into a directed graph, right, by putting, putting arrows on the links. But this directed graph has to be acyclic. So why does it have to be acyclic? So it cannot contain any cycles. Right, because there's a function, right? It's basically, I mean, if you will, it's, a, it's sort of the gradient field of a function, right? So, so the gradient field of a function is irrotational. So in the same sense, this is, uh, these are, um, uh, so this is, uh, so, so these, uh, th this defines an acyclic, um, so fitness graph, let me write it down here. So fitness graph. is an acyclic orientation of the hypercube. Okay, so I think at this point um, it might be useful to show a couple of slides um, to make this a bit more concrete and also show some pictures that are too complicated for me to draw. And so what you can already see in these pictures is that in some sense these, uh, <coughs> these graphs, these fitness graphs give you a kind of it's a kind of roadmap for the possible evolutionary trajectories, right? So, so you know, if we assume, and this is something that I will discuss uh, in more detail in, in probably on Friday, if we assume that, um, uh, that, that evolution is constrained to go uphill, this means that the population has to follow the arrows, right? So, for example, in this case, 
this would mean that eventually the population would end up here. And it's sort of obvious from this picture that this has to be the maximum, right? So maxima are points where all the arrows are showing, pointing up. So, so this, this arrow structure will give us a lot of information about the dynamics. And that will be sort of the main subject um, tomorrow. So now let me show you a couple of, uh, of pictures. Uh, so this is, um, this is the, um, okay. So these are hypercubes for, for larger L, right? So I, I drew for you the case L equal to two and L equal to three. And so here you have a four dimensional up to a six dimensional hypercube. So these are graphs that are highly connected. The connectivity is L, right? So with increasing L, you have more and more links and they are relatively you know, small, short distance. So the distance from one end to the other is, is, is uh, always L, okay? Um, ah, yes. Yes, it seems to be working. Yes, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, now this is uh, again basically a, a picture illustrating what I just told you. So we, we um, encode the genotype by this pair of binary variables. This is the representation of the function. And this is sort of showing in a kind of three dimensional plot what the landscape looks like. So this is again our little uh, genotype space. And, and this is the case of sine epistasis that, it, that I just showed you. So here, we have no epistasis, which means that this function is a linear function, which means that this uh, purple plane here is just a, 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 you know, just a plane. Here this thing is distorted a little bit, so here there is epistasis, and you can sort of see that, uh, for example, in the fact that this line here is steeper than that, so this means that, that if you, if you um, add the mutation at site one, uh, at, from this point on, you get a stronger increase in fitness than if you add it here. So this sort of distorts the surface. But here you have reciprocal sine epistasis. So you see that going from here to here, fitness goes down, but going from here to here, fitness goes up. Right? So this is, and, and what you can already see here is that this implies, if, so if you have reciprocal sine epistasis, uh, the landscape actually has more than one peak. Right? So then you have a peak here and you have a peak here. And so for example, if you start here, you can either go here or you can go here, but you cannot go back. Right? So that's sort of how, it, how the whole thing sort of um, informs uh, the, the dynamics. Uh, so let me, let me um, show a couple of historical slides. So the, uh, as I said, this um, concept was introduced by Sewell Wright in 1932. This is the title of his paper. Um, and these are two illustrations from that paper. And what you can sort of see here is that he very much already had the same picture in mind that we're using today. He didn't call these things zeros and ones, but he gave them letters. So this cross here is a wild type. And then you have three individual mutations, A, B, C. You have double mutants, you have triple mutants, and so on. So the whole mathematical structure of the problem was uh, very clear to him. Uh, however, um, the, the, the editor of this, of this uh, conference proceedings told him that this was somehow too complicated and he should, give a, he should show a simpler picture. And because of that, he, I think in the end, both pictures are in the paper, but he also added this picture here. So this is a kind of more traditional landscape representation. The problem here is, of course, you know, beyond, uh, beyond this case here. So here you can still draw the fitness as a function of the, the genotypes, but it's not you know, easy. You, you cannot really draw a function on top of this thing, right? Because you don't have enough dimensions. And so Wright instead drew a two-dimensional landscape picture and sort of sketched a function with sort of topographic lines. So here you have some peaks and some valleys and so on. He wrote in the paper that this is a very inadequate representation, right? So this two-dimensional thing is a very inadequate representation. Nevertheless, this is a pretty much the representation that stuck. So if you look into most biology, evolutionary biology textbooks, when they talk about fitness landscape, they will show some, you know, rolling hills and valleys like this. And so, but this is of course very misleading because a hypercube is not a two-dimensional Euclidean space, right? So one has to, uh, there are sort of many, uh, the in, intuition can be very misleading if you think that, that things are actually evolving on a, on a landscape like this. Um, 
So Wright was concerned about this. So Wright already believed that these uh, landscapes would be rugged. So rugged meaning that they have many peaks. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, and so he called them fields, right? So he said that in a rugged field, selection will easily carry the species to the nearest peak, but there will be innumerable other peaks that will be higher, but which are separated by valleys. And the problem of evolution, as I see it, is that of a mechanism by which the species may continually find its way from lower to higher peaks. So he was sort of concerned about the ruggedness of these landscapes because he thought this would be a kind of impediment to evolution. So you would tend to get stuck. And again, this is something that is not unfamiliar to, to many physical and computer science contexts where you, for example, you're, you have some optimization problem and you have to avoid getting stuck in suboptimal solutions, right? So it's, it's more or less the same thing. Now, in the 1930s, there was a rather vigorous debate between Fisher and Wright about whether these uh, uh, peaks would really be important, whether they really would be there. So this is a letter from Fisher to Wright. Um, it's a bit lengthy, but I think it's sort of, it's still interesting for mathematically minded people. So he's giving the following argument. In one dimension, a curve gives a series of alternate maxima and minima. Okay, so if you have a one-dimensional curve, right, then you know, each maximum is followed by a minimum and so on. Uh, but in two dimensions, two inequalities must be satisfied for a true maximum because you have to, you know, the, the um, matrix of second uh, derivatives has to have positive uh, or negative eigenvalues. I suppose that only one fourth of the stationary points will satisfy both. And so in high dimensions, I would guess roughly with n factor, so if the, if the landscape is n-dimensional, only two to the minus n of the stationary points would be stable, and any new mutation will have half chance of destroying the stability. So basically what he's saying is that random functions in high dimensions don't have many peaks, right? This is sort of what this argument is saying. And therefore, and this was more or less what he believed all his life, therefore these local peaks are actually not relevant for evolution. And we'll see, probably if I get that far, we'll see that, that you know, looking at specific models, in some sense you can understand that both of them were right in the sense that on the one hand, in, in high dimensions, the, the, the fraction of, of, of vertices, you now in the, in the context of this hypercube, the fraction of vertices that are peaks goes down, but the number of peaks nevertheless grows, okay? So this is, uh, this is something that this argument doesn't capture, mainly because Fisher is thinking here about, essentially about differentiable functions and not about functions on a discrete space. Um, another important precedent here is, is Maynard Smith, uh, who introduced in 1970 the concept of a protein space. So he was thinking about how evolution would, would proceed uh, in the space of all possible proteins. So he wasn't really thinking about, about increasing fitness, but he was just thinking about how a protein can evolve from one, type, from, from one uh, functional uh, uh, sequence to another without going through intermediates that are not functional. And so he compared this to a word game. Uh, the object of the game is to pass from one word to another of the same length by changing one letter at the time with a requirement that all the intermediate words are meaningful in the same language. Uh, thus, word can be converted into gene in the minimum number of steps as follows. And this is an ana analog of evolution in which the words represent proteins, right? So this would be a protein with, some, with one function, this would be a protein with another. And, and if, you, if you're able to go from one to the other, and this is again basically going in the having space. I mean, here it's not a hypercube because at, at each site you have in this case, 26 possible letters, but this is also a kind of mutational path in this space, and the requirement is that it only goes through meaningful words, okay? I should say that this analogy has actually recently been, been elaborated on, so now, you know, there are huge repositories of texts uh, available online which you can analyze, and you can sort of look at word frequencies, and you can search for these paths, and so on, so it's actually a rather nice uh, analog model of, of evolution. Yeah. Can the meaningfulness be accounted by chips? Yes, of course. But but here, but here in some sense, fitness is zero or one, right? So he's just saying it's either meaningful or not, right? So so in that sense, it's it's technically this is what is called a neutral fitness landscape, which means that you just assign fitnesses to be zero or one, and you're then interested in the path. It's it's more like a percolation problem, if you will. 
<clears throat> okay, so let me let me. So, so one thing that has happened over the last uh, ten years or so is that there has been a lot of more empirical data on fitness landscapes, and uh, uh, we we wrote a re review about this. And also, the one of the papers that I posted on the website, uh, there's this JSTAT review article um, from 2013. Uh, which covers much of the same material, but sort of in a more physics uh, physics language. So let me show you a couple of, of examples. This is a very, by now, very, very famous example. And in some sense, at least for me, this is the, 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 the example that, that triggered my interest in this field. So this was a paper by, again, by Daniel Weinreich and collaborators with a nice title, Darwinian evolution can follow only very few mutational paths to fitter proteins. And so what they, what they studied was a certain um, enzyme in, in uh, bacteria, in E. coli, that confers resistance to a certain type of antibiotics, right? So there's an antibiotic resistance enzyme. And uh, the, 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 the wild type state of that enzyme is a very poor enzyme. So it doesn't do much against the antibiotic. The way this is measured is by measuring the concentration of antibiotic that still allows the bacteria to grow. This is called a minimal inhibitory concentration. And so in some units, this um, concentration for the wild-type protein is 0.01. And it was known at that time that there were five point mutations that you could do in, this, in, this, in, this, in the gene of this protein that would increase the resistance, this concentration from 0.09 to 4,100. Okay, so this is a very good mutant. Um, and so what Weinreich was interested in is how could this have evolved, okay? And his picture was the picture that I'm also following here, which is that if, if something like this evolves, it has to be beneficial, it has to increase fitness in each step. So you're looking for a pathway, in this case, in this five-dimensional hypercube, you're looking for a pathway that increases resistance in each step. In order to know whether this is possible or not, you need to measure the resistance values of all the intermediates. So you have to create, in this case, 32 combinations, and these combinations are encoded here by these minuses and pluses. So this is all wild type. Here you have uh, one single mutant, here you have another, here you have some double mutants, and so on. Um, and this is what, what Weinreich did. So they sort of manufactured all these intermediates, they measured their resistance, and what they found is that it's, it's, it's possible to get to this peak, but it's not not very easy in the sense that there are not many pathways that go there. So how many pathways would there be, if all pathways were possible, how many pathways would there be to go from all zeros to all ones in a five-dimensional space? I haven't told you that yet, but maybe somebody can figure it out. Sorry? Five factorial. Five factorial, exactly. So 120, right? So here you would have 120 pathways. Um, and what, what uh, these authors found was that only 18 out of those were possible, and there were a the few who had particularly high weights. And so that was interpreted as, as an, an, an indication of high predictability of evolution. Right? So only 18 out of uh, what these 100, 120 are, are accessible. Now, this, in this experiment or in this analysis, they only considered uh, sort of uh, steps which would go forward in the hypercube, right, where you sort of just add mutations. In principle, of course, you can also revert mutations. So in a subsequent paper, they looked at the same problem, uh, allowing also for reversions. So this is a similar representation. But here you now see there are some paths which go back. So you first make a mutation and then, then you revert it. It turns out that that increases the, the, the possible number of paths enormously, right? So the total number of paths on the five-dimensional di five hypercube from one end to the other. So these are essentially all self-avoiding paths on the hypercube. Uh, it is an enormous number which grows approximately at two, as two to the two to the L. Um, but only 27 out of those are, are you know, accessible in this sense. Um, this is referring to the Lenski experiment, which I showed you in the very beginning. So this is a paper where uh, people studied five mutations that appeared in this long-term experiment of Lenski. So, so in this experiment, these mutations appeared in a certain order. So the population, if you will, uh, traversed a certain pathway. And here they, they again manufactured all the intermediates. So this is a fivefold mutant. And they found that this 
uh, in this case, uh, there is actually rather high accessibility. So 86 out of these 120 pathways uh, were found to be accessible. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, some, some of our own work uh, on a particular uh, fungal uh, uh, landscape. Uh, so this is actually altogether an eight-dimensional landscape. And this is, again, you know, an example of these fitness graphs. So here we have these arrows pointing towards increasing fitness and you can identify the peaks as points where all the arrows are coming in. And so five or six is more or less the, the, the largest number where you can still represent these graphs nicely on a piece of paper. Uh, so going beyond that, you need to find other representations. So this is a picture that I showed you already in the first lecture. This is the same landscape, but now for all eight, um, uh, eight mutations. So there's now 256 genotypes. Uh, which becomes a bit messy, but this is already by now not at all a large landscape anymore. So I think the last slide that I wanted to show you, this is a very recent paper um, from the group of Kondrashov that appeared in PLOS Genetics. Um, and so this just to show that, you know, with the, with the um, advances in sequencing technologies and, and high throughput experiments, it's becoming possible to explore these empirical fitness landscapes on rather large scales. So what they did here was that they explored um, uh, a fitness landscape that was built out of um, uh, um, mutations in a certain gene. So this is the HIS3 gene in yeast. And, and the way they did this was to, to look at variants of this gene that were present in related species, right? So they basically look at, 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 uh, at, at their, their original strain, and then they look at other strains and look at, at sites where um, uh, uh, there have been mutations, and then they combine them, right? So, that, so basically, they're sort of building a fitness landscape out of mutations that are present in other species. This is a very, uh, you know, this is a good way of doing this because if you just choose random mutations, most of the time you will not get, get anything that works. Uh, and altogether, they ended up creating almost 200,000 nucleotide sequences and 26,000 amino acid sequences. So this is an enormous uh, landscape. And, and so here you see there is a, the, the Hamming distance to the, uh, to the, to the uh, initial species uh, is up to seven. And what you, of course, see here also, this is again fitness, you see that there's, of course, most of the stuff that you, most of these mutations lower fitness, but you also have some stuff here that goes up, right? So you have a couple of, uh, a small subset of, of mutants um, that are actually uh, fitter than the, the ancestor. Um, and uh, you can, you can, and so this is, you know, these are now data sets which in principle you can, you can explore using the, um, the concepts that I'm, I'm introducing here. Okay, so that's all I wanted to, to say today. So tomorrow I want to um, discuss a little bit more or, or, you know, start to sort of move towards the question of dynamics. So we have these, um, we have these uh, graphs. And uh, first I want to say a little bit about what, um, what one can um, say in terms of simple models. And then we'll, we'll think about how to, how to describe dynamics on these graphs. Okay, thank you.